students of IIM Ahmedabad, faculty, guests, those who are virtually, digitally connected. Let me say what a great pleasure it is to be here today uh, and uh, uh, have a chance to interact with you. I uh, unfortunately belong to a generation where they didn't send us here for our mid-career uh, training. Uh, so I've not had the benefit of uh, prior exposure. But I was just mentioning that if the Indian ambassador in Moscow and in Ukraine are both graduates of management from here, I think di diplomacy and management has a fair chance in that conflict. <laughs> but uh, today, uh, today uh, my the topic uh, which uh, I chose to speak uh, was about the transformation of uh, Indian foreign policy over the last decade. Uh, and uh, when you look at, you know, how do you judge transformation, how do you perceive transformation? One, of course, is the manner in which we look at the world. Uh, you could, I mean, today, not just look at the world, how do we interact with the world? Uh, much of that has got easier. Uh, today, it's possible to get a passport in a few days. In fact, people grumble if it is more than a few days. Uh, whereas, uh, there was an era when getting a passport was itself a lifetime achievement, and uh, it suddenly took a few months, sometimes even longer. Uh, but it's also an era where more of us uh, travel abroad as students, as tourists, uh, in business, um, for work. Uh, so our sense of the world, what our expectations are of the world, uh, what our understanding of the is of the world is obviously very different from what it was a decade or two ago. At the same time, uh, what are the uh, consequences of the world are also something which we have come to realize very sharply. Uh, for the last two and a half years, all our lives have been deeply and dramatically affected by something which happened quite far away from us uh, and came to our homes and into our lives as a pandemic. Uh, we saw uh, how a conflict uh, can affect people. Uh, many of you would have watched uh, the 20,000 students who were caught uh, in the Ukraine conflict. Uh, or sometimes, you know, it could be what happens on our borders, what could happen due to terrorism in our cities. So there's no question the world means much more to us. It impacts our lives. We must understand it. We must study it more carefully. But actually, that's not what I want to focus on today. I want to focus on the mirror image of that phenomenon. How does the world see us? And part of the reason was, I said to myself, OK, I'm coming to an institute of management. So let me try to guess how they, you know, what is it, what is their way of looking at my business? And I, when I looked at the last decade, this transformation that I speak about, uh, I would suggest to you that there ha the transformation has most of all been in the branding of India abroad. And that means, in a sense, you can say, how does the customer see the product? In this case, we are the product, we India, and the customer is the world. So how does India see the world rather than normally what I speak about, which is what are the opportunities and challenges abroad? So uh, it is reflected in how we are treated by the world, uh, how we are respected or not by the world, uh, the extent to which we are welcomed in different societies, or occasionally maybe less, and where are the opportunities which come from all of that? Now, uh, the, the enhanced branding, the stronger branding, 
that I would suggest has happened to us in the last decade. To my mind, comes from 10 factors. And that's really what I would like to talk to you about. And let me start with the most recent one. Uh, I spoke about how uh, the COVID has impacted our lives. And I say this to you as a person who is traveling abroad through the COVID, uh, after the COVID, or I mean, the COVID's still there, but uh, less so, uh, who has had a chance to compare how others have handled it and listen to them about what they think about us. And people, countries, my counterparts, uh, students like you in other countries, actually are staggered if you tell them that, you know, we have done two billion plus vaccinations. And more than, I think, the, the, the public or the intelligentsia or the academic communities of other countries, it is actually the policy makers, because the policy makers really understand that it's, it was extremely hard to produce the vaccine in the first place, but to get the shot in the arm was actually an uh, exercise in itself. So for a society to organize itself and get two billion shots in the arm, is actually a staggering achievement. And it's an achievement that today, because we've all got those shots in the arm, we have normalized it. So I would like you to understand that it is an achievement which is deeply respected by the world, and it's something that we should be very proud of. Now, it's not just a shot uh, in the arm. If you Think back maybe a decade, maybe less. Normally, if something happened and, you know, there was a solution, uh, certainly in the medical field, we probably would not have been the first in the queue. You know, it would have happened. It would have happened in Europe, America. It would have found its way slowly, slowly to us. I'm not saying we'd be last in the queue, but for sure we'd be somewhere in the second half. And this time, actually, uh, we were not just around the same time as everybody else. But as I said, when it comes to, to actually organizing ourselves for the vaccination, we managed it. Uh, and even today, if you look at the percentages of people who've uh, had their uh, vaccination, we still compare very favorably to a very large number of societies in the world. And here's the really interesting thing when it comes to COVID. The, the COVID platform, the idea that from day one, and I was, thanks to my venerable age, in the first lot of the people who managed to actually get, get a shot. So uh, I think it was March 1, if my memory serves me right. Uh, so the prime minister got it in the morning. I went in the afternoon. And the... Um, fact is, the idea that you got your vaccination, you got your certification, uh, you got your phone message to go for the next one, that it was organized, <clears throat> you know, uh, in, a, in a way the, the cohorts came in uh, the way they did. That kind of, uh, I would say, uh, a systematic, digitized handling of vaccination is something which actually others look at us. And I would say uh, today the, the, uh, the, we have, of course, uh, a rep we have built a brand today as a pharmacy of the world. Uh, but we have also actually strengthened our branding uh, as a digital society. And that, to me, is the, uh, is the first reason right now why we are looked at uh, with greater respect by the world. The second reason is the economic recovery. Uh, and here uh, there were questions of, uh, very frankly, of judgment, of, uh, uh, of uh, experience, of really in a crisis 
where do you commit your resources, where, in what manner, how much, so that actually you come out of the tunnel with, in the best possible manner. Now, everybody had a fair shot at this problem. You know, there were people uh, who, who really gave big breaks to their businesses because they felt that the businesses were struggling and if the businesses would revive, it would trickle down uh, to the society. But different people handled it differently. Uh, uh, we focused a lot on creating social safety nets, and I'll talk about that uh, later. Uh, but we also used this period uh, to actually uh, uh, execute a lot of reforms and uh, changes, some of which you could say were overdue. But the fact is today, uh, we are poised for an economic uh, recovery for a growth of 7-8% which if you look at the rest of the world, you know, obviously developed uh, economies would have lower growth rates. So I'm not uh, comparing apples and oranges here. But even relatively speaking, I think uh, the world looks at our economic recovery uh, with, uh, again, a great deal of respect. But the other part of it was how, you know, where did we put our resources and what did we do here? Uh, I don't really know if we ourselves are fully cognizant of the enormity of what uh, we have done uh, in the last uh, three years. Uh, when I go out of India, I use a metaphor. I tell them, you know, I have an 800, 400 story to tell you. The 800 are 800 million people who from the time of the lockdown, a few months after the lockdown, till today, are receiving food from the government so that we never had the kind of problem we had when the Spanish flu was here, which was more people dying of starvation than actually of the disease. And the 400 number is the 400 million people who get money put in their bank accounts every month, which gives them that margin to deal with a very distressing period. And this 800, 400 has happened, again, because we are a digitized society. That we have today, thanks to Aadhaar, thanks to Jandhan Yojana, thanks to people having bank accounts, thanks to the bank account, the, uh, the phone number, uh, the in wherever required, the bank account, the PAN card, this connection, and the ability of the state to actually support its citizens without loss in transmission. This is actually a huge achievement. Now, you could say, okay, well, that's what you're doing at times of distress. But I want to drive home to you that there are actually, in a range of other areas, a, a vast social transformation which is taking place. The one which uh, of course, uh, uh, captured the imagination of the world the most was actually Swachh Bharat and toilet building. Because if there was a blot on our public image, this was one. And the fact that we have constructed 100 million toilets, that there is a very visible uh, improvement uh, in, the, in the cleanliness, in the sanitation uh, of India. Uh, that we actually today rank cities and compete, you know, create a competitive uh, environment for people uh, to, to improve uh, their conditions of living. Uh, that's actually had, again, uh, a very big impact uh, abroad. But if I were to give you some other examples, uh, you're all familiar with the Ujwala uh, scheme, okay, replacing firewood with uh, LPG. Now, the beneficiaries of Ujwala scheme exceed the population of Germany. The beneficiaries' last count is 93 million. There is today a scheme called Pradhan Mantri Avaz Yojana, which is to give, you know, uh, to uh, support house building uh, in India. There's an urban variant, uh, which right now 6 million houses have been done. 
the, the rural gram, uh, Grameen Avas Yojana, which 18 million people have been done. Now, if you consider 24 million houses which have been done in this period, and if you take the average size of an Indian family, which is 4.8, that means 110 million people in the last three years have a home of their own, which they did not have uh, before. Now, I could give you other examples. I mean, Mudra, the loan scheme. The beneficiaries of Mudra exceed the population of the United States, 350 million people, of which 230 million people are women. So this scale of what is happening in India, in fact, if you even tally up our, uh, the various insurance uh, yojanas, between the three of them, the, the beneficiaries, and the obviously will be overlaps there, are 450 million people. So that sense of a India, you know, uh, if, if there is uh, a feeling that a country is under transformation, actually large parts of the world are looking at us, not necessarily getting into the debates that we have in India. And, and you know, those debates are natural in a democratic society. But because they are at a distance, in a sense, they are cutting out the clutter and looking at really what is changing in India. And they see an India today, uh, which is far more digital, which is far more socially supportive, uh, where the infrastructure is coming up at a very rapid rate, which is much easier to do business. I mean, still far from perfect, but much easier to do business. And where, is, where there is a certain buzz and an energy, uh, which uh, I think the world values. Because if you look at the rest of the world, very honestly, uh, you know, uh, as, a, as, a, as a compulsive traveler, you know, every time I want to feel optimistic, I come back home. Uh, so, uh, so that's really uh, uh, the state of the world. Now, the third factor is actually the impact we are making on the world, because the world is feeling that impact. Now, there are different ways you can quantify it. You know, our exports today are more. Uh, in fact, last year was the highest ever exports we've had, which is $670 billion. Because we are a, grow a developing economy with a high rate of growth, obviously our imports are more as well. And our imports are maybe about $100 billion more, $750 billion. But I want you to understand again what this means when you go out. And I've just come back from a part of the world where Indians, even Indian foreign ministers, normally don't travel or don't travel as frequently as they should, which is Latin America. Now, when I went to countries like Brazil and Argentina, we are today buying multiple billions of dollars of particular products, say take edible oil. Our, our import of edible oil from Latin America alone is today maybe about $4 billion, $5 billion. So what has happened? I, I don't think it's something which is obvious to us sitting at home. At the other end of the world, India has become the fourth largest trading partner of Argentina and the fifth largest trading partner of Brazil. I bet, I'm, I'm pretty sure that surprised many of you. I mean, you would have thought, okay, we'd be trading, but maybe our numbers would be uh, very much less. It's also the, what the, val the value, the, uh, the benefits the world is discovering in terms of the economic impact we can make. And a lot of that is our human resources. So it could be the R&D side of India, it could be the contract manufacturing, the, the, the design contracting that takes place here. It could be today actually physical manufacturing in India. Because uh, we have made it easier to do business, because actually the quality of human resources is improving, because there is a culture of innovation uh, and startup and technology in this country. When you have, you know, when the public discourse today says, you know, I've changed the drone policy. We have produced 100 unicorns. That's a very different discourse than we had five years ago or 10 years ago. And the world is responding to that because uh, you can see that 
for example, in the uh, volume of the foreign direct investment, uh, which last year was also at an all-time high of $84 billion. So the sense, uh, again, the economic sense I want to convey to you is for the rest of the world, we are mattering more and more. We are mattering as a market. We are mattering as a producer. We are mattering as an inventor. You know, uh, I cannot tell you how much respect there is for the fact that we made our own vaccine. You know, that, re that has really resonated. So this, you know, you've all heard of made in India, for sure. But that sense of invent in India is also something which is, which is uh, uh, today getting traction. And I think it's very significantly responsible for uh, upgrading uh, our brand. Now let me move out of the economic side uh, to the political side. You all know uh, we are going through, uh, the world is going through a very complicated conflict in Ukraine. And the world is very polarized uh, as a consequence. Now, in a very polarized world, obviously you come, you know, all countries come under pressure from this side or that side. The fact that we have taken an independent stance, the fact that we have made decisions which we believe are the right decisions from the perspective of the welfare of our people, that is something, again, the world has noted. So the, the uh, independence of India's positions uh, the, and, and the balance, I mean, uh, uh, the, it's, it's not just about us. In many ways, uh, we are also articulating the sentiments and the feelings of a lot of other countries who may not be that confident today uh, in expressing the same. So uh, the, to my mind, the fourth reason for the brand improvement is re really that uh, a stronger uh, confidence and a more independent voice with which uh, we have spoken out on global issues and made our decisions uh, on that. A fifth one is actually how resolute we have been. How resolute we have been, uh, for example, uh, when we have been challenged in the border areas. Uh, you know, uh, two, two years ago, uh, in the middle of COVID, uh, we had uh, the, uh, the Chinese uh, actually move forces uh, in violation of agreements. Uh, and the, that we stood our ground uh, that uh, two years from then, we have been working it out uh, without making concessions. Uh, I think, again, the world has, has noted that, uh, that uh, this is a country uh, which is capable of defending its interests, that it will not yield, uh, that uh, uh, it would be uh, both strong on the ground and vocal in terms of putting out its uh, interests. Now, uh, one part of it, as I said, is obviously about, you know, the, the gains you make, the interests you defend. But the world always also looks like we do at people, you know, how creative are they, how, how, how uh, innovative are they in looking at issues. And we have emerged in the last few years as among the more innovative uh, powers when it comes to diplomacy. And two examples of that innovation uh, actually both involve uh, four countries. One is uh, a mechanism called the Quad uh, that uh, we, uh, we revived uh, in 2017. It had a false start a decade ago. Uh, and today is actually counted as among the uh, more effective, more credible uh, platforms to deal with uh, shared challenges and common concerns of a lot of countries in the Indo-Pacific area. On the other end, in the Middle East, in West Asia, uh, we are attempting something. It's at an earlier stage. It's something called I2U2. It's a, it's a grouping of US, India, UAE, and Israel. Uh, and uh, uh, here, the focus is much more on uh, the economic uh, uh, technology 
uh, sort of civil society uh, cooperation. But uh, that we have been nimble, we have been creative, we have, we have create, you know, we have done something that is very contemporary when it comes to diplomacy, uh, which is a diplomacy which was stuck either in treaties and alliances, or which hoped the UN would step in every time there's trouble, and the UN has been less and less willing or capable of doing it. Or that people found bilateral fixes. Now, we have come up with a none of the above answer, uh, which is there are situations where countries have to come together, uh, find ways of working together. Uh, not necessarily doing it with all the rigor and the legal commitments that traditional diplomacy is used to. Uh, and that actually has, is something the rest of the world uh, is looking at with a lot of interest. Now, having said that, uh, uh, you know, uh, we are, we are uh, in many ways a very unique society. Uh, we have a lot of Indians abroad, uh, about 32 to 34 million Indians or people of Indian origin uh, live and work abroad. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, we increasingly treat the world not just as a marketplace, but also as a workplace. And this determination, willingness on our part to look after our own at times of difficulty, this has also hugely resonated with the world. And we saw that during COVID. Uh, we, you know, uh, many of you would be familiar with what we call the Vande Bharat mission. And during this period, depending on how you count the numbers, technically about uh, something like, I think, 8 million people plus came back uh, on the Vande Bharat missions of various forms. But a very large proportion of them actually were people who were returning home because they were stranded abroad uh, during COVID. And this was the largest, actually, as far as I know, recorded evacuation that any country has ever done in history. And uh, I mean, of course, from an from uh, institutional point of view, uh, for us in the foreign ministry, it meant while everybody was working from home during COVID, our homes were in the office during this period because we were actually working 24-7, uh, 365 days a week in multiple shifts uh, so that this uh, 7 to 8 million people could actually come home. And this, this was very important. It was very important because it showed this could be our tourists who were stranded, it could be our students, it could be our workers. You would be surprised how many Indian seafarers there are today in the world. And when COVID happened, in many cases, the shipping lines discharged them at some port. Uh, and then they had the challenge of coming back. So how do you, you know, a, a country is respected. The, if it demonstrates that willingness to do what it takes to look after its people. And the COVID that way was, uh, was a situation which, which compelled us and we dug deep uh, into our own strengths and I think surprised ourselves in many ways by how much we could do, just as we did at home through vaccination. I think Vande Bharat was also an example of what an all of the government and all of the system approach could do abroad. But you've had also more recently uh, uh, more dramatic examples of that, uh, Operation Ganga during the, uh, during the Ukraine conflict, uh, where it wasn't just that 20,000 students were stuck. They were stuck in the most difficult part of the country where there was actually fighting going on, where we had to, uh, to in a sense, persuade the, uh, the uh, countries involved to, to halt their operations for our people to come out and then bring them out while the rest of the country was also on the move and bring them out to absolutely the other end of a very large country. And that we could do this, that, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, again, uh, I've actually had counterparts who began by telling me, you know, we got, we actually got two planes out and 
So it's sometimes it's a bit embarrassing. They'll ask you, so how many planes did you get out? So you sort of say, okay, well, I had 90. Uh, but, uh, uh, but the the point I am making is, again, you know, you would have seen at that period the, the focus and the commitment with which the Indian system went to deal with this uh, situation, that uh, you had uh, five neighboring countries. In fact, to each one of these countries, a minister was deputed saying, you go there and you stay there till everybody comes back. And you will personally make sure that the people coming back are uh, well looked after and well organized for the return. So I say this again because, you know, time passes by, events happen, people come back, and we then, it's somewhere there at the back of our minds. But you have to understand, abroad, it's one more element of our cumulative image. That it's, it's a country which is not only willing, you know, as I said, to deal with its seafarers and its a blue collar or white collar workers abroad, but which will actually go into conflict situations and pull out its people. And then comes the other part that it's not just about us. We have actually also developed the image of being what we call a first responder. Think back on some of the natural disasters of, say, the last seven, eight years. And, you know, fast backwards a bit more. And I want you to remember the tsunami, the tsunami of 2004, December 2004. When the tsunami happened, a large part of the relief effort actually came from the US, from Europe, uh, from Japan. Uh, a lot of tsunami happened. I mean, it was an Indian Ocean tsunami. We were the only Indian Ocean country which actually pulled our own weight. But the rest of this uh, zone actually looked beyond the region for assistance because people didn't have the ability or the uh, the uh, responsiveness for that situation. Now, look over the recent past. It could be the Nepal earthquake, it could be the Yemen civil war, it could be uh, we had a, a mudslide in Sri Lanka, uh, actually a water system breakdown in Maldives, a typhoon in uh, Myanmar, a cyclone in uh, Mozambique. And at least from Africa till, I would say, uh, Philippines, you know, if something happens today, we have been there, we've been there among the earliest, uh, and the expectation of the region too, and that's what again counts in terms of branding, that uh, in the last decade, we have built up a very credible record as a first responder. A first responder not only to their troubles, but every time actually we go in for our own people, and if there's somebody else out there, we bring them back to. It happened at Wuhan. Our first lot of flights which came back when the COVID happened there had foreign nationals in it, even from Ukraine. I mean, many of you uh, heard stories of uh, citizens of other countries who came back. So the, the idea that, you know, this is not only a country which today has the capability of, uh, you know, looking after its people, it has the generosity also to look after others. And then, of course, there's always the most noble cause, how do we save our planet? And I don't mean that facetiously. I mean, there are today existential problems. I, I think you can see what's happening in Pakistan. Uh, the enormity of climate change, I think, is now making itself felt in different ways. It's happened in India, too. I mean, uh, most parts of India this year have got more rain than they've had uh, for a long time. Uh, many parts of India, certainly where I live, has experienced heat and cold of a, of a degree which is not normal. So if you are looking at the big issues of the day, I mean, to my mind, climate change is one of the biggest issues. It is an existential issue. And so are we the laggards out here or are we the leaders out here? I think... That too is a debate which is increasingly moving forward uh, on, in, a, on a, in a favorable way to us. I mean, people today, when they think of India, they don't think coal, they think solar. 
uh, when when you know uh, they they uh, as I said, digital is one part of our changing image. Renewable is another part of our changing image too. So uh, a country today, which at our level of income, for us to contemplate uh, green growth, to make the adjustments, to embrace the technologies to do that, that is that actually requires very bold leadership and and a very deep uh, commitment uh, to ourselves as well as to the planet. And I think uh, if you look in the field of uh, climate action, actually it's interesting. In the last few years, there have been two big initiatives, something called the International Solar Alliance and another one called the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure because natural disasters are aff affecting the infrastructure, so you have to plan for them uh, in advance. Interestingly, actually both initiatives have come from India and both today... Uh, the Solar Alliance has more than 100 members. The, uh, the uh, CDRI is moving up into the high double digits. And finally, uh, I would say uh, what adds to the uh, transformational message uh, uh, of, of India on the move is actually our culture, heritage, and civilization. Uh, you know, in 2014, uh, when Prime Minister Modi came to the U.S. Uh, many of you remember that famous Madison Square Garden event. At that time, I was ambassador uh, in the U.S. and uh, uh, he came to, he addressed the U.N. And he shared with us, saying that, look, uh, uh, think about yoga. Think how universal it can become. Everybody in some form is doing it if it can be, uh, if it can be uh, collectively, universally motivated and promoted. And, you know, uh, really, in a sense, driven by him, uh, we actually went to the UN uh, end of that year, got a resolution passed, got a certain global branding uh, for celebrating yoga. Our yoga had a branding. But the idea of the entire world coming together on one day to, I mean, this, this was taking it to an altogether different level. And this year, in fact, you, you had uh, the celebration of yoga as the sun rose, it actually uh, was celebrated around the world. Uh, and, uh, you know, in, in the intuitively in the minds of people. It is something which is very deeply connected with India and with Indian civilization. Now, uh, along with that, there is a, a greater promotion of traditional medicine, of uh, health and wellness practices of India. And the interest which the world is today showing in India is something important. It is important for the world's understanding of India because uh, at the end of the day, we are a civilizational society, which is once again, you can say, taking its place in the leadership uh, of the world. So uh, if I were to sum it up, to me, an India, which is now all of you, I think, would have seen this probably today and yesterday, fifth largest economy. We were tenth largest a decade ago. So a fifth largest economy, a digital economy, one which comes out of the pandemic stronger, uh, which, which today is among the largest, fastest growing major economies of the world, which has a talent and skill and the capability to address a lot of shortages uh, in, in a very demographically challenged world economy. Uh, and a civilizational state which has its heritage, its culture, its experiences to bring. A democracy which debates its problems, which is able to harmonize uh, its interests with those of the world, which can look after its people, almost one-fifth of the world, but which has time and mind space for other people as well. I think that's the brand which, in my view, we have built in the last 10 years, which I believe uh, has has really uh, transformed our image. I quite accept that this is work in progress, 
but I'm very confident that that work will continue. So once again, thank you for your attention, uh, and I will of course be happy to to address or listen uh, to anything that you might have to say. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Minister, for that uh, excellent summary of uh, how indeed India's place in the world has changed over the last uh, decade or so, and how people in the rest of the world uh, look at us. Sometimes one needs to be reminded that we are indeed moving uh, forward in, in great steps, and I think that was uh, very well put together. Uh, with your permission. I will kind of set the ball rolling with questions and then Yakshit as well and we will also ask the audience to ask you some questions. Uh, and in the spirit of we are doing well but how can we do better, mm -hmm. um, I would like to ask, start off by asking a question about the service, the foreign service itself. Uh, you have been a member of the service and now as minister you head the service. I have always wondered uh, at the sheer masses that the diplomatic corps employ in countries like the US, or even Brazil for that instance, a country of 200 million people uh, has maybe twice the number of diplomats that India has in the field. So in a sense, um, uh, we, we are uh, in a sense uh, not, do not have the, the mass that one requires to be able to carry things forward in a on a larger scale than has been the case so far. It's not that we have not been doing a good job. Uh, however, how do you see that playing out? You know, when the US has like 8,000 plus diplomats and India is fielding, I don't know, 800, 900,000, uh, or China has mm -hmm. you know, 170 oh. missions and mm -hmm. we're at like 125 and so on. So how, how is, do you see that playing out? Well, uh, you know, the, I can give you answers at multiple levels. First of all, First of all, I like the idea of having more people. And I hope you can advocate this so that I can persuade the finance minister uh, <laughs> that, uh, uh, that I have a good case. <coughs> uh, having, having said that, uh, you know, look, the truth is, uh, though people think we have a large government, when I look at many other countries and polities, we don't. It's not just our, our, that our diplomats are thinner on the ground, you know, our police people are thin on the ground, our administrators are thin on the ground, our doctors and, uh, you know, hospital administrators. So pretty much any part of the state and the state apparatus, I think uh, we have not grown commensurately to the demands of the economy and society. So. In diplomacy, I'm facing what is also a general problem. Having said that, I would say, okay, you know, there's a third angle to it. See, we, in an interesting way, we undercount. Uh, we're a, uh, we're, you know, we're, as a bureaucracy, we're quite rigid, okay? So what happens, we categorize people, and we say, you know, this person is a diplomat, and that person is support staff, not a diplomat. So. The way we do the bean counting, we narrow the number of people we categorize as diplomats. If you look at a lot of other countries, people we do not categorize as diplomats are categorized by them as diplomats. So there is a lot of truth in what you say. Uh, I, I honestly believe that you know, there should be uh, more diplomats, but I honestly believe there should be more people uh, you know, in other government services uh, as well. You know. Uh, I, uh, I, I accept the maxim that we should have, uh, 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 in a sense, minimum government and maximum governance, but from the point of view of the efficiency of the system. I mean, to me, I, I cited the example of passports. I mean, if you, there, there were a lot of things in, in the passport process which we really didn't need to do, and which were, which were uh, tautological, which were, I mean, sometimes ridiculous. Uh, I mean, you ask somebody else to certify who you buy. Uh, so, I mean, you could certify it yourself, which is what you do now. Uh, so, uh, the, 
so my, my uh, take is that it's something which I hope will happen. Uh, we have certainly in this decade, uh, I think, uh, created about 25 new embassies. The bulk of them in Africa, because we were very underrepresented in Africa. Uh, in fact, I've just come back from opening an embassy in Paraguay. Uh, we are opening two of them in the Baltics, uh, because you know these are very strong digital societies, uh, very uh, you know very tech savvy people with whom we need uh, deeper deeper ties. So we will grow, uh, but uh, I could always do with more people. Sure. So just to build on that point a little bit, as we move forward. Um, and we need to negotiate all of these different things, including uh, trade agreements, political things, and so on. Uh, and with increasing technology deployment across many areas, there, there would be a need for specialists and mm -hmm. generalists. Mm -hmm. um, the service itself, as it has evolved over the years, uh, takes in generalists. Maybe some people specialize over time. Uh, how does that play out in terms of our ability to be able to generate better outcomes uh, going forward. That division between generalists and uh, uh, specialists and how that process is managed at the ministry level, at the service level, and so on. Uh, you know, uh, there's a case to be made either way, OK? If you are super specialized, you miss the woods for the trees. Uh, if uh, you are really generalized, you don't see the trees. So, so you know you got to find find uh, some some uh, balance there. Uh, we what we try to do we first we take the first level of specialization. Uh, what particularly in the last ten years because I have been associated with the senior management of the ministry for the last ten years. We have, for example, said the the first filter is a kind of a language cultural filter. So. If you have learned Chinese, keep going back there. Now, I must admit I am a violation of that rule. Okay, but I belong to a different era, and you know, some the exception cannot, in a sense, be the rule in this situation. But for me, the idea that we have strong regional specialization, Chinese, the Russian zone, the Arabic zone, the Spanish zone, the French zone. Uh, and, and I regard even the U.S. actually as, as a specialization. I, I think uh, it's, not, uh, it's not that anybody who learns English can automatically go and navigate the United States. It is a very unique country. Uh, so uh, try and get people much more systematized into a, what you might call area specialization. But we are also at the same time, we encourage people, uh, you know, people who've done trade negotiations, who have done stints in the Commerce Ministry, uh, people who've done multilateral work, people who've done uh, disarmament or uh, I would say technology uh, related, cyber related stuff. So it has to be, you know, it's a balance. You, you're never exactly going to get it right. You'll have to keep moving it up and down. But uh, there is another part of it. And the part of it is the solution which is outside. Uh, uh, a big change that I see in the bureaucracy for the better. Uh, by the way, I see a lot of other changes also for the better. Uh, but the, it is the willingness of the system to say, I have a complex issue. The domain expertise is in some institute, in some other organization. It may not be within my narrow silo. And I am prepared to go out there, ask them, harness them, bring them in. Uh, and that degree of consultation and interaction with institutions outside, that has actually been very much uh, on the increase. So a lot of what we are, you know, I mentioned, for example, uh, International Solar Alliance. Now, we have worked with a range of uh, people. I mean, in fact, the person who heads it now uh, is a person who used to be in the government, but who's gone up and down, up and down uh, you know, uh, uh, between, uh, you know, he was with Terry for some time. So I think that cross-fertilization 
has been good. Uh, but uh, again, uh, I, you know, I'm, I realistically, I'm not going to grow the size of the bureaucracy to meet my demands. So it's much more sensible for me to harness the creativity and energies and knowledge of other institutions. I think that's the fix. That's, that's good to hear. Yeah. I hope that we will also be a part of that. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I mean, you, you are already. I mean, we, you know, after all, look at it this way. We have a training institution. So ask yourself, why do we send people to you? Because our belief is that after the training that we do ourselves, there are still gaps in our training, which they will fill if they come to you. So you are actually a model for me. We look forward to much more, sir. Let me hand over to Yakshit. Yes, sir. Um, so there's a lot of commonalities that we see with Latin America, as you just mentioned on the demographics, uh, the middle class economy that we have, the energy demands, and as well as the climate goals that we have. Uh, did we miss out anything since the last 70 years? Or to reframe it better, what silver lining did we see right now so that the terms of engagement have been increased? And do you think? Are there any kind of synergy that we, you think can be implied in entering Africa as well from the learnings that we have from Latin America? Uh, so if I understood the first part of your question, you're asking me, did we miss out anything with Latin America? Yes. Oh, Since we missed there's... out a lot. Yes. Uh, we missed out a lot because very frankly, I think distance, mm -hmm. uh, physical distance created mental distance. You know, uh, you would be surprised uh, sometimes at the questions which are asked at either end about the other end. Uh, I would still argue that there are big gaps out there. But what has changed, of course, is uh, because we are, uh, you know, communication, uh, information uh, is, is much more uh, available today. And trade has also global, you know, become more global. So. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I spoke about edible oil. So we, in fact, import two kinds of oils from Latin America, oil for the stomach, but also oil for the cars. Now, in the old days, people would have said, you know, getting oil from Mexico or Brazil or Guyana is so far away, it doesn't make any sense. That's no longer true. So the logistics component of uh, transaction has got so manageable today. So all this is part of a globalizing world. So to my mind, in fact, there is a, uh, there is a phase of discovery of each other, which awaits us in the India, uh, Latin America relationship. And we in the government will have to encourage it and foster it by going there ourselves and uh, setting an example. But I do see uh, in many ways you know, uh, the, uh, uh, the sort of trade leads the flag here. Uh, that I see Indian businesses there. Uh, I mean, I, I could see in, in uh, ma you know, mining and metals, in power transmission, uh, in agriculture, in seeds, in chemicals, in IT. Uh, Indian businesses are there. And sometimes they're in fairly substantial numbers. But there are still big gaps, and I, I think that's one region we really need to play uh, catch up. In the case of Africa, uh, we, we have a kind of a pervasive footprint because almost every African country, first of all, is an Indian community, uh, historically. Uh, and, but the question is, how do you deepen that? How do you take a presence and make it into something more substantive? Uh, we have, uh, in the la after, especially after a big Africa summit we had in 2015. We have really stepped up our commitments in terms of projects, in terms of training, uh, exchanges uh, with Africa. Uh, and as I said, uh, we've opened 18 new embassies in Africa. So uh, today we would be among the countries which have a very intensive uh, Africa presence. The challenge for that, again, is how do you translate that into business? And that is happening because, again, uh, you know, if you look at the export figures uh, last uh, the year, which is just over, uh, we had set a goal of $400 billion. We exceeded that. But a large part of that growth is actually uh, also coming out of country, you know, of Africa and Latin America, which were previously kind of taken, taken very lightly. 
Uh, so, so there is scope there to grow because for us these are relatively unexplored markets. Uh, so, what uh, message do we have to offer for the G20 presidency that we are taking up? It's a, honestly a bit early in the day mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the G, you know, uh, the baton kind of still hasn't been handed over to us. Uh, the summit will be in November in Indonesia. Uh, and uh, uh, we have to see how that summit fares before we sort of take over the responsibility. Uh, and the reason why I'm uh, cautious here is uh, uh, not because I want to be dodgy about it. Uh, there are genuine challenges right now given the polarization uh, of the world. Uh, and I, I think in particular, uh, how the uh, repercussions of the Ukraine conflict are playing out in different forums, uh, you know, in different domains. This has become a very big uh, concern. So uh, in the current stage of uh, volatility, you know, to me, three months would be a long way off to predict. Uh, so uh, I would therefore hesitate. But if I were to do a little bit of forecasting, you know, there's there's no doubt today energy security is a huge concern for people. I mean, if, if the price of oil has effectively doubled, it's, it's really hurting uh, a lot of economies. And I mean, it's hurting everybody. But, you know, uh, it's one thing to be $50,000, $60,000 per capita. It's another thing to be $2,000 per capita. At $2,000 per capita, you don't have the margins really uh, to take that kind of pain. Uh, we've also seen it reflect in uh, food inflation. Uh, so that also is a cause of concern, not just inflation, shortages as well. And disruptions of various kinds, you know. So trade is getting disrupted, uh, uh, you know, commodities of various kinds, uh, their availability, and therefore their uh, prices are getting harder to predict. So uh, I, I, I would say the entire world is concerned, but Clearly, the global south, the developing countries, the relatively low-income countries, their anxiety is very much stronger because they don't have the resilience, they don't have the resources uh, to deal with this challenge. So in some form, because uh, the G20 at the end of the day is a kind of a economic, you know, it's, it's a very heavily economic platform. It's an economic developmental platform which then gets into politics from time to time. But it's not primarily, a, it's not a security platform. It's a, uh, and uh, I think these concerns, these concerns about these stresses, you know, the debt situation. Uh, I mean, two, two, three years of COVID, and then uh, the Ukraine issue coming on top of it. And then in many cases, climate, climate change is coming uh, on top of it. So, I mean, you, you're really getting every possible stress hitting you uh, at the same time. Uh, I, I think, uh, to my mind, in some form, these concerns would be foremost uh, in the mind of people who would be meeting. So, Yakshit heads up our uh, public policy group. He's a PGP2 student. I should also share with you that we now have a JSW school of public policy uh, where we are trying to build connections with policymakers uh, and uh, increase the range of interactions that we have uh, with various governments in the country. Uh, since we are kind of running a little bit short on time, I think maybe it's time to open it up uh, for the audience to ask some questions. So let's go with a few. Uh, are we, do we have a mic that can, yes, we go, that can go around? So over there. Good evening, doctor. Uh, my question today is in regards to our Indian media, which is clearly uh, struggling with TRPs every day when we watch the news. Um, news today is clearly very biased and more often than not scripted to put out an image of India that is in sync with the colonial mindset. And this is to please Western audiences and often mislead our own. What should 
Ro what role should our media play to do its bit and reverse the colonial mindset? And where are they going wrong? Uh, can I do one thing? Uh, if I could maybe take three questions at a go. Okay. It might, it might give people a fairer shot at... Uh, but, gentlemen, so yeah. we have a very one of our um, first alumni from the first batch, Mr. Ender Modi. So I'm going to invite him. Go ahead, Inderji. Sir, you mentioned about rising exports, and you also indicated that the imports have been even more uh, rising much faster. As a result, our trade deficit has been increasing month on month, and therefore the rupee value against dollar has gone down from 70 rupees to 80 rupees a dollar. So do you think uh, we have something more to do in various ways, ways so that the rupee value doesn't go further from 80 to say 100? Thank you. And one more maybe from the back over there. Uh, sir, I have a question for you. Uh, considering the dragon that we have besides us, China, uh, we have had a love-hate relationship with them. Uh, so what is India's take considering recently you said that we have to work jointly and closely uh, if it has to be a decade of uh, India, not a, a century of Asia. Uh, so on the one hand, we want to cooperate with them, but on the other hand, they are showing ulterior motives. So what should, be India's, uh, what should India's take be in such a situation? Okay, thank you. Uh, well, let me start with the media there. Look, I, I'm not sure, uh, I mean, clearly uh, some of what you said uh, has a basis, but if you look at the colonial, you know, what you call a colonial mindset, a, a lot of it is, uh, in our case, uh, debates we have within our country, which we seek external validation on those debates. So, you know, uh, will you and I will argue, and then you will say, you know, but uh, somebody in London, this magazine, this British magazine said it, or that American newspaper said it, because in your mind there's a there's a kind of a superior wisdom uh, there which you are now trying to employ as a backup artillery to your own uh, arguments. My sense is, you know, this is having less and less uh, impact. Uh, if you if you look at uh, uh, you know, uh, how people react, how policy reacts, how even the media reacts. I mean, often people say, well, okay, they may say this, but, you know, I mean, you shrug your shoulders and you move on. I think uh, uh, what we have seen in the last uh, 20, 30 years is a, a broader distribution of economic capability in the world after a lag of about 15 years that was reflected in a distribution of political influence. Today, uh, I think the challenge is, in a sense, a kind of a cultural intellectual rebalancing, which follows a phase of economic rebalancing and political rebalancing, uh, which is one of the reasons why actually the Prime Minister on August 15th, you know, uh, said that we need to put that mindset uh, behind us. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a mindset issue. It's, you know, it's not an issue of whether I speak to you in English or not. I mean, I can speak to you if you'd like in some other language too. It's the thinking which we are verbalizing which uh, is an is a issue of concern. My, my own feeling is the more, the, you know, I look at any institution, any gathering of people, uh, and try to ask myself, how would the same gathering have been 30 years ago, 50 years ago? And I would urge you to ask yourself that question. And I promise you the answer is we are far more diverse. We are, in that sense, actually far more democratic. And my ultimate proof of this is the Indian cricket team. You know, you take the Indian cricket team and look at where the Indian cricket team, the origins, the cities they came from, uh, their you know, the backgrounds. What were they, say, 1960? What are they in 2020? And that, to me, would be a, a very illustrative example. On the issue of uh, deficit and currency, you know, first of all, my, you know, I'm not an economist, but my common sense understanding of uh, a global, global uh, uh, sort of 
I would say policy tells me, a lot of what you're seeing on the currency is not a function of, of a trade deficit. I would one, one uh, currency which has gone down dramatically against the dollar is the euro. You know, it's not that suddenly Europe's uh, trade account has changed. What happens at moments of deep global stress is there's a movement towards the dollar because still the dollar is the safe harbor for the world. And uh, in fact, if you were to take the Indian rupee vis-a-vis -vis pretty much any other currency in the world, relatively, relatively, we have actually been impacted less. And these are some pretty strong currencies we're talking about. We're talking about the euro, you're talking about the yen. Uh, so uh, I think the real anxiety is the more the economic turbulence uh, as a result of the COVID uh, consequence and the Ukraine conflict continues, uh, we are going to see, uh, you know, challenges here, not just us, the whole world is going to see that. With regard to the, uh, the trade deficit, uh, you know, there are two parts to it. One part of it is at a certain stage of development, you are going to import more. You know, it's, 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 it's not just us. Everybody in that stage of development has done it. But we are also to blame because we did 20, 25 years of globalization where we did not think in terms of developing our supply chains domestically in the way in which we should have, in the way in which, which other countries did. I mean, if you look at a China, Japan, a Korea, a lot of them actually uh, supported their SMEs during the period of growth. In fact, we exposed them to international competition of the most unfair kind. And uh, for us today to say, well, you know, why are we importing more? We're importing more because we neglected uh, sectors of our economy, which we are now trying to rectify. I mean, the whole idea of Atmanirbhar Bharat is that which is that, you know, we have a primary obligation to our own businesses. Uh, and every other country does. Uh, I mean, we were one of the few who give other countries not just a level playing field in our economy, in many cases, their advantages, including non-market advantages which they have. We allow that to play out in our economy. So uh, that is the correction which we are trying to uh, today bring about. Uh, and last issue, how do you work with China, well, I guess this one led to that automatically. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, we are, we are, you know, everybody wants to get along with big countries, especially if they happen to be neighbors. It, it's sensible, okay. But you want to get along on reasonable terms, on terms of mutual, mutual respect and mutual interest. So the issue is not whether we should have good relations or not. I mean, uh, who would say that we don't want good relations? We want good relations. But good relations cannot be at a cost of our national interest. It cannot be at the cost of our disturbed boundary. So, so I, I think uh, the, the, my, uh, you know, uh, the reference which you quoted was my, hope that we would be able to resolve our differences and get along with what is in our common interest. So that is my hope. Now whether it is my expectation or not will depend on that.